if the amount of space that the animals use in the wild is typical, you know, for, for what they've actually evolved for, it's not like a recent product of man changing the environment. But if, if that is a true representation of what they have evolved to utilise, then even if they could have it smaller, then I think there's still some argument for having that larger size because, for example, I could have everything I needed in this room. I, I could have I could have an oven over there. I could have a fridge. I could I could have all my food brought you, in from brought wish. in online from Sainsbury's. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, ah. yeah. you could have your set of dumbbells in the corner to get ripped. <laughs> ah, now you're going too far. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, you you could have everything you needed in in um in the room, but in a day I would be just going mad. I'd be needing to go out for a walk. Yeah. You know, people people with hamsters or whatever. You put a wheel in there because even if even though they've got all the food and water and stuff they need where they are, they still want to run. You know, you, you, you've, there are videos out there on the internet of leopard geckos using hamster wheels. <laughs> you know, just space. Yeah, mm-hmm. is but something we need to provide. Them. That is Let something. Me... Oh, go on, go ahead, Harvey. Oh, is that okay? I, one of the things I'll just jump in there and say though is one of the one of the worst animals that we keep welfare wise is people. So, for instance, hunter gatherers. <laughs> Hunter gatherers would, on average, walk about thirty to thirty-five kilometers a day, run and walk, and no one, no one even on on this call will get anywhere close to that. You know, you'd have to devote six hours a day at least to exercise, and that's not, and that figure isn't is, isn't sort of including weightlifting. You know, moving resources back to camp, whatever. So, it, yeah, yeah, in a way, I think everyone sort of has everyone at least on this call i hope has a good welfare has a good happiness level um so <coughs> well, <I'm a> bit <laughs> <fat>. <laughs> there's a little bit of awkward pause there um so what the point i'm trying to make is do we need to walk 32 kilometers a day to be happy and healthy do we need to have a territory of 100 square miles no and my point is similar to, you know, the animals out in the wild. Do they need as much of an area to demonstrate purely natural behaviour? I don't think so, but then I don't know. So it's an interesting question when you consider what what how what is that space utilization gonna look like? And this is I, I really do, and, and I can legally do this, I really want to go and catch just a common lizard fit it with a radio tracker which you can do completely legally and then just put it put it back in the wild and just see what it's sort of like distribution looks like so then i've got my own data that i've collected that i can then take and and you know build an enclosure from because i think that it would be really genuinely interesting to see what sort of the space yeah, call it that. The space utilization is like of these animals, whether it is literally every piece of of land that they that's in their territory is used or whether you know it is just for resource collection so it would be a really interesting study to do um but yeah that comes down this comes down to do you go on this (laughs) this comes down to the actual individual animals fitness as well i mean take bearded bearded dragons there there's so much footage of them in trees and babies are you keep babies in captivity and you have the cage guard and where are the babies in pet shops? Clinging to the cage guard because they're at that stage they are, are more arboreal. But I spoke to someone recently about I wanted to build like a six foot high, six foot long bearded dragon enclosure and allow it to climb. It's just, I mean, they occupy the same sort of heights and areas in the wild as field dragons do. And the person in the pet shop said to pet, the person in the pet shop said to me, well, they aren't made to climb. They're just going to fall and hurt themselves. I was like, it was, he said they wouldn't have the same muscle development to climb. I said, well, if you put a frilled dragon in a completely flat enclosure and then suddenly, after a year, put it in a big enclosure, it's going to be awful at climbing because it hasn't got those muscle, muscles developed to climb. 
Same thing for a beardy. When someone says to you, oh, a beardy's arboreal, and then you give it a massive tree, that beardy is going to be awful at climbing because it has no muscle development for mm. that activity. Same thing with when I tell people that raw pythons in the wild are semi-arboreal. Now, if you're a rat keeper, that ball python or raw python, we want to say, is going to have the worst muscle development in the world. So when they're like, oh, okay, I'll test it, and they're like, see, it didn't climb, well... Or fell it's, off. It's fat and lazy and has mm-hmm. no muscle. What do you expect? Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's interesting you say that because when we first set up the European Tree Frog Breeding Group, um, we, we raised some of the animals indoors in just a, just a little sort of exoterra just to get them bigger because they were tiny. Um, and when I first put them out into there, so it was a fruit cage design to start off with. And I put them out in, into, the, into the sort of the enclosure and they were awful at climbing. Like there was a big fig tree in the middle. They were awful at climbing. I mean, they kept falling off to the ground. I mean, that's not great, is it? But they kept falling off to the ground. But after about a week, they did start to develop to cl- and, and climb. And this is an animal which is l- literally nearly 100% arboreal. Yet, you know, if you keep it in a smaller setup where it doesn't have those abilities to climb, it won't be able to climb. So it makes perfect sense that if you keep an animal in a sort of flat enclosure, literally – then it won't be able to express um, those sort of natural behaviours. And and that's another point, actually, thinking about not only are we talking about physical muscle development, what about sort of behavioural mental development? So behaviours which animals need to learn sometimes socially. I mean, I know that reptiles and amphibians aren't necessarily the most social of all animals, but there will be certain behaviours that animals randomly learn that maybe we don't give them the opportunity in simplistic setups. Me and Liam have, a, have another uh, collab coming out about that soon yeah. to do with leopard geckos, which we won't spoil. But there's there's definitely that there are there are papers out there talking about learned social behaviour. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Um, leopard geckos, and um, but yeah, let's let's not go down that route <laughs> just yet. Well, it's interesting the. Uh, Going back to Harvey's example of the the hunter gatherer tribes, you know, walking thirty to thirty five kilometers a day and being very fit compared to most people now. Although, if you were to take a modern day athlete, they would be so much more healthier and more fit than somebody yeah. who is a hunter gatherer. So the, yeah. there is that there is that potential of having an artificial setting that can make that can exploit the natural biology of a being and make them stronger and better than they would be in the wild. So that is what we can actually strive for in captivity in a way. We could actually make these animals healthier by providing proper nutrition, proper enrichment, proper muscle development than they would potentially be in the wild. Well, well, that's the whole point about captivity, isn't it? And like Mariah's video is brilliant. You know, we have to take away the negatives, but also we can't have something that's just neutral. We have to have something that actually benefits and adds to the animal. Um, exactly. And I think like a prime example is like most polar bears in the wild now, at least, unfortunately, due to climate change and habitat loss are malnourished. Like the, I think the majority of the population is now malnourished and that, they've been that way for quite a while. Um, and obviously you wouldn't want that happening in captivity. And so you would provide them with a more balanced diet, which would allow them to reach a, a better weight. So they can obviously breed in captivity if that's the, if that's the aim. So yeah, I think that is a rel- that is a, a very important point. You know, we need to we need to almost we need to almost have a mindset where we improve upon the wild, mm-hmm. uh, but not sort of downplay some of the crucial and important factors which determine a healthy animal that are already in place in the wild. Mm. Strip away the negatives of the wild, but make sure you don't strip away the positives with them. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, almost. And in a further addition to that, strip away the negatives of the wild without stripping away the positives, but also introduce the positives of captivity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I want to take us back to. I know we've kind of gone off a little bit away from the bioactive. There's one more thing I, we're kind of touching. As we usually do. Yeah, that's <laughs> totally fine. Every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm happy to do that, but I want to I want to just touch on two other issues before we continue down because we're kind of in that realm right now, you know, introducing the negatives of the wild and whatnot, or trying to avoid that. One of the points that was ro- uh, that was.